Okay, now I'm going to start my talk. So I have been tasked with the wonderful task of uh, giving you some highlights from our release paper. Like Russell said, our release paper um, had a whooping 105 authors. Uh, we included everyone who, of course, contributed to the paper, but also people who contributed to the data gathering. So a lot of our coders and pages and everyone was uh, co-authors with us, which uh, was really fun, fun experience. Um, our release paper is called Grandbank Reveals the Importance of Genealogical Constraints on Linguistic Diversity and Highlights the Impact of Language Loss. And it can be organized into sort of three major themes, spatial phylogenetic effects, um, so the effect of space and contact versus uh, language uh, history uh, in terms of family trees um, on the, the structure and the design space, uh, unusual languages and effects of language endangerment. These are the ones I'm going to touch on today. And I really want to highlight that besides that all the data is available, all the code that went into all of the analysis is also available. And you can rerun the analysis if you want. And besides that, if you are working specifically in R with GrandBank data and you want some handy functions to like make the data wide or binarize it or impute or stuff like that, we're developing an R package called R GrandBank. And also Simon is developing R CLDF, which is going to be handy for our usage of CLDF data sets more broadly. So really keep an eye out for that. Um, so I'll start off with spatial phylogenetic signal and the science space. So linguistics have been interested in how, what it is that shapes grammar. Besides sort of universal cognitive constraints, is there an effect of space and, and contact events, or is there more an effect of language history as we would expect to see with uh, lexical material? There have been different people who have suggested that grammar falls in, uh, uh, to one or the other side. For example, Lyle Campbell has been more of an arguer that it is not so much language history, it's more diffusion and stuff like that. Uh, Johanna Nichols has argued that there are some features that are more aerial and some that are more genealogical. And then uh, Michael and uh, others, and Matsume and others, have argued that there are a few features that have quite a strong deep tree history to them. Michael, again, sitting over there. Uh, so we decided to have a look at that. The first thing we did to get an overview of what our data looked like was uh, do a principal components analysis. So what this does is a technique for dimensionality reduction. So like Russell said, we have 195 features in our data set. Um, if we think of those as 100 dimensions, that's impossible for our mind to compute. I don't know about you, but I can't even imagine a fourth space dimension, let alone 100. Um, and also, if we want to know which dimensions actually explain the most variance in our data, that's not all of them. So there are many techniques for reducing these dimensions into a set of uh, a set of dimensions that are ordered by how much they explain the variance in your data. There's PCA, uh, multidimensional scaling, or principal coordinates analysis, TC, UMAP, etc. We decided to go with the more conventional, traditional, plain PCA. First, we pruned our data set to only uh, features that have a low amount of missing data. And we also binarize the ones that are multi-state. And then we ran a PCA on it. And out of that, we get a series of principal components that are ordered by how much variance they explained that are made up of many of the dimensions, uh, the, the original features. <sighs> um, if you are curious more about how PCA work, I really recommend looking at the YouTube lecture by Yulia Silich. It's like 10 minutes, and it's really good and accessible. So uh, in this multidimensional space, if you have a number of points like uh, these points here, um, what the components do is you can imagine that if the points form a cloud, you shoot an arrow through it, such that the most of the arrow is inside the cloud is along the longest stretch of how the cloud stretches out. And then the second one is the second most uh, points, et cetera. So when we did this uh, for Grand Bank over here, uh, we found that the first component explained 9% of the variance in our data and the second one 7. And with a uh, non-graphical cattle 3 test, we found out that the no optimal number of components to explain our data is 19. So out of our 113 features, that reduces down to 19 optimal components. Um, if we just compare that for a sort of fun comparison to, for example, genetic variation in Europe, um, they found that their first components explained 0.3% of the data, which is quite little. Um, I'm not a geneticist and I'm learning a lot about genetics from being in this institute, uh, but it's a lot. I know that 0.3 is less than nine. <laughs> the second component in their data explained 0.15. 
So you could say that it looks like the grammatical structure as uh, appreciated by Grammank has uh, more uh, structure in a way than the genetic variation. And then if we again compare it to a music study that was done a couple of years ago, they did a Bayesian PCA, but for comparison, um, let's not compare it directly, but get a sense. Their first component explained 15.5% uh, of the data, and the second one 6.2, and the author amount of pieces was three. So music looks like it's maybe can be reduced to even fewer sets of basic dimensions than uh, grammar. So grammar falls somewhere in between genes and music, <laughs> is, uh, just to give you guys an overview. If we then look at these first two components um, and look at what features of grammar load onto them, so that means that are contributing to those uh, dimensions the most, uh, this here, A, is the first component, and B is the second. Um, if you're a linguist, you might notice that these are abbreviations of grammar features. A lot of these, not all, but a lot of these have to do whether a marker is bound to something or whether it's freestanding. And the second component, a lot of these have to do with gender noun class stuff. Not all of them, but a lot. So we wanted to see if that was actually true. So we took our features and we took all the features which say if something is bound or not and we computed what we call a fusion score, which overall tells that over all the grammar features, how much do you have a yes to for features where we ask if something is bound. This is actually one of the complexity uh, scores that Olena will be talking about later today. And if we correlate that, so we compute a score per language and we take the component um, uh, coordinate per language, then we get this plot here. So this is the fusion score, how much bound stuff the language has, and this is PC1. They're quite correlated. <laughs> um, so that tells us that one of the major components in our data is actually to do with something that's similar to what linguists have been discussing about isolating agglutinative and polysynthetic languages. Not exactly. I am aware that that scale is not all about just how much bound stuff you have, um, but it's not entirely unlike it. Is it? And if we do the same for the gender and noun class features, we also find a correlation. So we can interpret that to mean that uh, our second component mainly has to do with uh, gender uh, noun class, if you're a language that does a lot of gender or not. So that gives us some insights into our data. If we then take these two components and add in a third one as well, we map those onto, this was Damian Blasi's idea and I really enjoyed it. So yeah. what this means is we take the uh, color dimensions, RGB, red, green, blue, and we map on the red hue to the first components, the green to the second one, and blue to the third one. So that means that uh, this color space becomes the three-dimensional PC space. And simply what that means is the more similar you are in your color, the more similar you are in your position in this coordinate space. And if we look at this, we can actually see sort of some families. We are DLCE. We have a bit of a soft spot for Austronesian languages, as you might be aware. And we can sort of see Austronesian a bit here. So this is the green uh, Taiwan and Philippines, and then it switches out quite green over here. And then uh, mainland New Guinea is a lot of them are sort of blue or purple shade. So we can sort of distinguish families somewhat. If we uh, take only the first dimensions and make uh, a scatter plot. So in this one, the X uh, dimension, X axis is PC1 and Y is PC2. And we highlight different families. So the gray points are all the other families, and then we've just highlighted ones. We can see that some of these families are quite constrained in where they are in this space. So Dravidian, for example, occupies this little corner. Mayan are quite close to each other. And then there are some other language families, like Afroasiatic, that sort of goes all over the space. Um, there are many reasons why this might be. Afroasiatic might be unusually grammatically diverse, or it might be that um, the grammar questionnaire happens to not capture the things that define Afroasiatic language families. Uh, yes, that's a little bit about just a way of looking at the space PC, but if we want to actually test the spatial phylogenetic effects, we wanted to do a more rigorous test. Um, we use uh, something called an INLA model. So INLA stands for Integrated Nested Laplace Approximation. If you are similar with BRM, if you're familiar with BRMS, a Bayesian regression modeling using STAM, uh, INLA is not, where's my in lab boys, Sam and Russell. Uh, 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 in lab is not exactly the same thing as BRMS, but if you had a toolkit, they do a similar job. Like, yeah, somewhat. 
they, they do it differently, but um, for the purposes of this, what we do is we run a model per feature where we give it a matrix of the phylogenetic tree, a precision matrix, and of geographic distances, not raw distances, but sort of manipulated somewhat for uh, extreme distances. Uh, and we ask put for this feature, how much do these two matrices explain their distribution in the world? Um, and that tells us how much of the sort of phylogenetic signal versus the spatial signal there is for that feature. If we do that feature-wise, uh, we get these plots here. So these are the grandma features divided into some different domains, features that have to do with clause, nominal domain, pronouns, and verbal domain. And uh, the x-axis is how much of the variance for that feature is explained by the phylogenetic matrix, and the y-axis is how much of it is explained by the spatial matrix. And most of the features cluster down here in the lower right quadrant, which means that they are mostly explained by phylogeny. So at least for gram length features, we can say that if we compare how much the tree explains the data versus space, tree is explaining more of the distribution. If we look at one of the features that is the most explained by phylogeny, so we use the, um, I should say as well, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that earlier, we use the global language family tree uh, from Remco Bouquet, Quentin Atkinson et al., uh, often called the edge tree, 10 minutes left, right? Left. Um, this is the global tree. Uh, you can see some families you might know. Here's Austronesian, here's Atlantic Congo, there's Austroasiatic, there's Uralic, and uh, a yellow color means a one for the question if it's verb final for transitive clauses, and a uh, dark purple means a no. So this is how it's structured for that feature, which has the most fallow signal. We can sort of see clades tend to be similar color. And if we look at the feature that has the most spatial signal, that's the one about demonstrative classifiers, which might not be super surprising to a lot of linguists um, who know things about mainland Southeast Asian languages. And that's the distribution of them. It also does occur somewhat in South America and in other places, but it's generally clustered here. <sighs> okay. Then we were thinking a bit deeper about time and the design space. I am I am gonna try and hit my 20 minutes, but it's maybe gonna be a little bit hard because we did do a lot of things in this paper. <laughs> uh, Stephen Gold uh, had this thought about what if you rewind the life? What if you uh, go back in history and stop and start again? Do we end up looking the same? Do species of the world end up looking the same if we replay? Or do we explore a different part of space? Would we all have you know heads down and feet up or whatever? Um, for this, we decided to look at if the languages of the Americas were exploring a different part of the space compared to the languages of Africa and Eurasia. So here is the world map, believe it or not. Uh, here is Africa, where we all come from. Here's Eurasia, and here's Australia. And here is the Americas, right? So the Americas were uh, colonized by humans at a much later point, in multiple ways, but at a later point. And we wanted to see if if those languages in our data set were exploring a different part of the space. So what we did was we took all of the languages and we organized them into regions inspired by the Autotype project. And then we did uh, what's called a fixation score, fixation index, which is a technique borrowed from genetics, where you ask how much do these groups uh, are similar to each other compared to how similar all the languages are and how similar each uh, languages are within a group. So you get a between group distance in the end of it that takes into account overall prevalence and also um, intergroup variation. So what you get out of that is this lovely network. Now each node here is a region in the world and a group of languages and if it's orange it's Americas and if it's blue it's not Americas. My wonderful category. If anyone has a better word for not Americas I'd be glad to hear it. Uh, and in, in uh, this network, if you have a thicker line, it means that you are more similar given these overall uh, frequencies, as I said. And what we see here is that the Americas don't really cluster as a separate module in the network. They're quite integrated in the middle of the network. And if we do an actual network modularity score, we find that they're, they don't form a separate module. Uh, and this could, we could infer from this that it doesn't look like the Americas is exploring a radically different part of the space. This could be an inkling that maybe there is something that governs the structure of grammar that is beyond just a random walk in space. And next up, I'm gonna talk a little bit about unusual languages. 
This one says 15 minutes, but he said, ah, I know why. Uh, so unusual languages also, yeah. Unusual languages uh, lets us see some of the limits of this design space that I mentioned earlier. So we uh, we can see sort of where we touch up against the, the boundaries of what's possible. So what we decided to do was take all of our features and organize them into sets uh, that go together using a local kernel of density estimation and ask what are not only unusual feature values, but unusual combination of feature values within each of these groups. And it's not weighted for area or family. And this was analysis done by all of these lovely people. And what we get from that is an unusualness score per language, given Gramac data, how unusual are you? And in this case, if you're a dark purple, you're very unusual. And if you're light, you're very usual. Now, a lot of these languages that we've highlighted as the most unusual, like Kuat or uh, Hadza, et cetera, might be familiar to some linguists in the audience as language isolates. So these are languages that have no known uh, language family associated with them. And we actually looked and saw the number of ISOs we have overall in our data and the number one of them that show up as most unusual. They are actually overrepresented, which could be an inkling to tell us that ISOs are not only unusual lexically, which is typically how we define them, but they're also unusual grammatically. And um, the distribution of unusualness is uh, can be predicted by area and family. So there is some signal, which also has to do partially potentially with our sampling. So for example, languages here are very usual. We have a lot of languages here, but it's not massively oversampled, actually. So these are just like the most common languages in the world, according to us. If we look at how many languages are similar overall, uh, and just look at how uh, many uh, features you have different, you can get something called a Manhattan distance. There are five languages in our data set that are completely identical when it comes to grammar features, uh, but the average is something around 38. Okay, lastly, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to go a bit over time, I'm aware, yeah. Um, uh, the last part of our paper explores the effects of language endangerment. So I wanted to make uh, you all aware that we are currently in the decade of indigenous languages, as announced by UNESCO. It's going to continue into 2030 and be associated with a lot of campaigns, both from UNESCO and local organizations. And if we look at the world today, if you go to the wonderful uh, app on Glottolog called Glottoscope, we have one of our wonderful Glottolog editors with us in the room today, Harald. Hey, Harald. And we have one of the creators of Glottoscope there, Robert Forkel. Hey, which is a lovely app. Um, the languages here are a darker shade of red or black if they are uh, severely endangered. And we can see here that only 2,700 languages are not endangered in any way out of 7,000. So this is, a, this is something that's facing a lot of communities uh, today. And of course, I want to highlight that the, the effect and the loss and the disappearance and, and dormancy of languages, of course, is mainly felt by those communities. Uh, it's a loss of identity and heritage and culture, which also has, as been shown in several studies, also uh, physical and mental health outcomes. Um, there are studies that show that if you get access to your heritage language, you actually become more healthy, which is, of course, the most important thing. I'm going to be talking to you a day about the effect of language loss on, on how we explore grammar, that is not the most important thing in the world, but it's something that is important to us in this paper. <laughs> so if we look at that, what we decided to do was borrow a term from ecology called functional richness. Uh, so this tells us how much how much area of the space you're exploring. This was work led primarily by uh, Sami Greenhill and Damian Blasi. So what they did was do a classical MDS or a principal co co coordinates analysis, and then compute a functional richness score per uh, all the languages in our data set and then per region and then remove the languages that are endangered and see how much functional richness we lost or lose is the, how English works. Um, so here on this panels, this is the MDS space, uh, first dimension, second dimension, and the dark colors are the languages that are not endangered and then these are all languages. Same here, this is all languages and these are the ones that remain, that's the functional richness that remains when the indigenous languages are taken out of the equation. We can see that for the global, we lose some functional richness, but for certain regions, the effects are dramatic. Of course, there are some regions like Northeast South America where all the languages are endangered. So when they disappear, we lose everything. Um, there are some regions where we lose uh, up to half, like uh, Greater Abyssinia. This again is regions from uh, Autotype. 
and uh, yeah, there are a lot of dramatic ones and a lot of uh, ones where we lose more. So it is this functional richness is hitting differently in different parts. Yeah. What lovely that this is my last slide. <laughs> um, so some of the major takeaways, genealogy trumps genealogy, geography, <laughs> isolates are structurally unusual and we are losing structural disparity in an uneven manner. If you remember anything, remember those three things. All right, thank you so much for your time.